introduce myself. Uh, so, myself Sumi Putta, I am working as a senior uh, engineering project manager with Ericsson Technologies. And uh, my role towards the organization, I am working as a child coach, taking care of uh, multiple projects, guiding them uh, with the different agile uh, methodologies and different framework in place. And uh, I have been attending a couple of sessions with uh, Ericsson Bridge and a couple of meetups as well. So uh, this is my session uh, where we are going to be presenting basically about Scrum and it's a uh, so I, I, I think everybody of uh, us over here are aware of at least basic of the Scrum side. So uh, this session is primarily it's an analogy uh, where we have compared photosynthesis with, with Scrum. Uh, for successful uh, software development. So it's like the four senses of agile trees for software development. So it's like my last five to six years of experience, I've learned that uh, as, as, as we grow in an organization, as we move towards applying Scrum, so the more we apply the agile principles to it, the, uh, the action mindset to it, the more we get the value out of it and it's not a silver bullet which we get immediately the effect of it so it, it takes time so that's why this analogy helps us to compare uh, scrum with a with a photosynthesis model i think everybody over here is, is aware of photosynthesis right, right. so I, i'll just uh, touch up about the basics and then uh, we can move forward already mentioned uh, it's a correlation with photosynthesis which help us to visualize the complete scrum workflow and focus on agile principles and values there. I've used various antonyms which would help us to uh, find the various key characteristics, the patterns and anti-patterns which I've at least experienced in my past five years of careers that uh, has helped me to convert various teams into high performing teams and optimize the organization as a whole. And at the end there would be some thoughts which would help us to awaken uh, some, some thoughts in our mind. I think it, it, will, it would be awakening thoughts for us. So I'll, I'll start with a very small video. In a giant bowl of energy-packed carbon crunches, one spoonful, two, three. Soon, you're powered up by the energy surge that comes from your meal. But how did that energy get into your bowl? Energy exists in the form of sugars made by the plant your cereal came from, like wheat or corn. As you can see, carbon is the chemical backbone and plants get their fix of it in the form of carbon dioxide, CO2, from the air that we all breathe. But how does a plant's energy factory, housed in the stroma of the chloroplast, turn a one carbon gas like CO2 into a six carbon solid like glucose? If you're thinking photosynthesis, you're right. But photosynthesis is divided into two steps. The first, which stores energy from the sun in the form of adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. And the second, the Calvin cycle, that captures carbon and turns it into sugar. This second phase represents one of nature's most sustainable production lines. And so with that, welcome to the world's most minuscule factory. The starting materials, a mix of CO2 molecules from the air and pre-assembled molecules called ribulose bisphosphate or RUBP, each containing five carbons. The initiator, an industrious enzyme named Rubisco that welds one carbon atom from a CO2 molecule with the RUBP chain to build an initial six carbon sequence. That rapidly splits into two shorter chains containing three carbons each and called phosphoglycerates, or PGAs for short. Enter ATP and another chemical called nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate, or just NADPH. ATP, working like a lubricant, delivers energy, while NADPH affixes one hydrogen to each of the PGA chains, changing them into molecules called glyceraldehyde-3 phosphates, or G3Ps. Glucose needs six carbons to form, made from two molecules of G3P, which incidentally have six carbons between them. So sugar has just been manufactured, right? Not quite. The Calvin cycle works like a sustainable production line, 
meaning that those original RUBPs that kicked things off at the start need to be recreated by reusing materials within the cycle now. But each RUBP needs five carbons, and manufacturing glucose takes a whole six. Something doesn't add up. The answer lies in one phenomenal fact. While we've been focusing on this single production line, five others have been happening at the same time. With six conveyor belts moving in unison, there isn't just one carbon that gets soldered to one RUBP chain, but six carbons soldered to six RUBPs. That creates 12 G3P chains instead of just two, meaning that altogether, 36 carbons exist, the precise number needed to manufacture sugar and rebuild those RUBPs. Of the 12 G3Ps pooled together, two are siphoned off to form that energy-rich six-carbon glucose chain, the one fueling you via your breakfast. <coughs> Success! But back on the manufacturing line, the byproducts of this sugar production are swiftly assembled to recreate those six RUBPs. That requires 30 carbons, the exact number contained by the remaining 10 G3Ps. Now, a molecular mix and match occurs. Two of the G3Ps are welded together, forming a six carbon sequence. By adding a third G3P, a nine carbon chain is built. The first RUBP, made up of five carbons, is cast from this, leaving four carbons behind. But there's no wastage here. Those are soldered to a fourth G3P molecule, making a seven carbon chain. Added to a fifth G3P molecule, a 10 carbon chain is created. Enough now to craft two more RUBPs. With three full RUBPs recreated from five of the 10 G3Ps, simply duplicating this process will renew the six RUBP chains needed to restart the cycle again. So the Calvin cycle generates the precise number of elements and processes required to keep this biochemical production line turning endlessly. And it's just one of the hundreds of cycles present in nature. Why so many? Because if biological production processes were linear, they wouldn't be nearly as efficient or successful at using energy to manufacture the materials that nature relies upon, like sugar. Cycles create vital feedback loops that repeatedly reuse and rebuild ingredients, crafting as much as possible out of the planet's available resources. Such as that sugar, built using raw sunlight and carbon, converted in plant factories to become the energy that powers you and keeps the cycles revolving in your own life. Just a uh, uh, question from you guys. If, uh, I think the intent of showing this video was how the cycles invoke the vital feedback loops and how the nature's most sustainable cycle, which is photosynthesis, is producing sugar continuously. And similarly, if we compare this with scrumming, scrumming is, acts as a working software factories, which produces software if we provide it with constant and valuable inputs which is required, which in our case is well-defined product backlog, along with the right cultural mindset and enablers tools. So it can work as a continuous flow of generating continuous software, working softwares. So that's that's the correlation which has been used to adapt to the mindset of Scrum. So how Scrum can be used to generate working software. So if you understand the correlation, the photo, the, the, the source of energy is compared to product backlog and the CO2 which is close coordination and collaboration along with water which is the key enablers which produces sugar, the working software along with O2, the operational efficiency and optimized organization as a whole. So these are the byproducts if we follow Scrum efficiently and uh, intelligently with all the uh, key practices in place, we will be able to produce an optimized organization as well as the operational efficiency. The working software would also be produced. So this is the kind of the correlation which has been used. So uh, so I think uh, I have covered mo most of these uh, items if you see the correlations. The trees have been compared with the agile team, agile teams, the scrum teams, the leaves with the, t with the team members, the CO2 with coordination and collaboration water with enablers, sun, the source of requirement, the stakeholders, end user requirements, and the non-functional requirements. 
I would be covering each of these uh, separately in the, in the coming slides. And spectrum is the wide spectrum of light which has been compared to the strategic themes, use cases and ideas. The visible light which is extracted from the spectrum is the product backlog which we use to build our product. The sugar which is uh, produced as an end result as a working software. And O2 which is produced as a byproduct is the operational efficiency and the optimized organization. The Calvin cycle has been compared to the sprint cycle, which is the complete cycle of producing software. So the first, the team members, which is compared to the leaves. So the analogy used, if you see the leaves, the key characteristics which I mentioned over here is, are the key characteristics if it are in place would leave, uh, lead to an efficient team. So the first one is the learning ability. The team should be able to learn and spread the spread the learnings across the various teams and uh, the learnings can be shared by various uh, modes like in our organization we have formed various forums and uh, various guilds guilds we say as uh, to develop competency across to develop the craftsmanship across the various teams and uh, across the organization itself so uh, like we form, we can form guilds of uh, automation. We can form guilds of uh, like uh, as continuous integration and similar guilds, so that teams are able to share their energy across the various uh, learnings across the various teams. And teams should be empowered. By saying this, empowered, it's it's a very generic word. We when we say that the teams are empowered, how to basically empower the teams? When the teams when the teams are self empowered. That means you have to give them the actual culture or they should be empowered to raise the obstacles which they are facing. So uh, we, we say it's, it's, it's very difficult actually to make the fields, make the culture actually build within the teams. So uh, we give them the rights to raise whatever impedance which they are facing, whatever is slowing them down actually. We have followed a practice in our uh, organizations like maintaining an obstacle board. So teams are free to raise obstacles, impedance which they are facing. Even if if teams are facing, like, like, let me give an example. Teams have raised obstacles that the lifts in the organization are pretty slow, which is slowing them down so that they are not able to work efficiently. So these kind of even obstacles they can raise. So when they raise these kind of obstacles and they get resolved, they get escalated to a higher management and higher, even to the AVP's level. So they, they feel empowered. Our value, our things are getting addressed and they, they feel empowered and then they are efficiently work. And similarly, the next one, the aspirational and, uh, and the affectionate. So teams, teams should be aspirational. They should aspire to learn. Like if they are weak in one area, they should be aspirational to, to go and learn and say that I should be the subject matter expert in this area. I should, uh, I, I am weak at this area, I should be learning in, in this particular area. So they should identify their strengths and weaknesses and aspire to learn in, in other areas. And similarly, they should be affectionate and they should respect other individuals as well. So these these are though very basic cultural aspects, uh, I, I, I very generic ideas, but it's actually the very key, key points. The, when we say seeds we sow, the kind of tree we get. So these kind of cultural aspects are very, very uh, important for building a successful agile team. The, the next one is volunteering. So they should be volunteering to take uh, take up the initiatives. Like in the scrum of scrums, they should be volunteering to uh, be a representative. So we, you should keep on ro rotating the team members so that one representative is presenting in one of the scrum of scrums and then the next time there's another representative who's uh, presenting and then so so that team should voluntarily be saying that I, I voluntarily to participate in this meeting I should be uh, presenting this meeting I should be taking team forward for this kind of discussion in this particular forum so and that can come by introducing challenges to the team they are putting challenges to the team a same thing, a same requirement can be presented to the team in a different ways. So that, that makes them voluntarily vote for it, that I, I'll do it, I'll accept this challenge. And the next one is enthusiastic. They should be enthusiastic, they should be smart and skilled. 
those these are very very generic basic but but to incorporate these different kind of uh, initiatives which can be done so that team are self motivated to take initiatives and uh, and it, it, it doesn't take uh, one day to get all these things incorporated within the team it takes months it takes even years i have seen even with some teams when they we transform them some of them they transform it very efficiently these these words look very generic but in practice when we put them in practice it actually requires a lot of effort to get these things incorporated within the team similarly the next one is is the scrum teams which is the combination of all the scrum teams uh, it can be one team it can be multiple scrum teams so the analogy we are, where uh, which we have used is uh, with the trees is the teamwork the transparency the team should work as a team instead of individual contributors many times what we have seen is the individuals and especially in india where where uh, we are fighting with with competitors always trying to show off that i am the best i can do this i can do